The four ball test is a pretty ubiquitous one in our industry. So it's often used as a screening tool when we're doing formulations, but you'll also see it on product technical data sheets. Now people use it as a proxy for kind of EP performance, but should we really be using the four ball test to select lubricants? Now let's dive into a little bit about what the four ball test is and what it isn't. Let's set up a very basic system. So imagine that we have a ball and it is in contact with another ball. Now think about the point contact between these two. Theoretically, if you have two spheres that are in contact with each other, they are in contact at an infinitesimally small point. So it's what we would describe as being a point load. So zoom in a little bit closer and that point load comes into kind of sharp relief. Now, if we have these two balls rotating at the same speed relative to each other, what we would say is that this point contact is being loaded in a rolling motion versus if one is kept stationary and we roll the other one, that's more of a sliding motion. And obviously one of these is more severe from a friction standpoint than the other. So if we have two balls that are rolling relative to each other, the amount of friction generated is much less than if one is held stationary and the other one is sliding. So this gives us a little bit of the mechanics as we start to talk about what is the four ball test actually testing. Now, in most circumstances, we don't actually have two balls that are rotating relative to each other. So let's take the example of two rollers. So, you know, two cylinders. First of all, because they're not spheres, it's no longer a point contact. And what is actually between them is a line contact. We see this a lot in things like plane bearings, for example, where actually the contact surface is a little bit bigger, right? Because we have a shaft rotating inside of another shaft. But now imagine that we shrink that middle shaft so that it's much, much smaller. And that's kind of more like a, a rolling contact bearing. Now in this instance, again, the contact is a line contact, but most of the time you have rolling motion. So there is not that same amount of friction as when we have one stationary and one rolling. So we've got a, uh, one surface that's rolling relative to the other. The, the sliding contact that we sometimes see if the, uh, the rolling elements are skidding along the race is actually an undesirable condition, which is often brought about by, for example, a grease that's too thick or we have lubricant starvation or something like that. So that is an undesirable condition. But what we're trying to kind of convey is here that it's very, very rare for us to have point contacts. And when we do, it's usually a rolling contact rather than a sliding one. Now take the situation of gears, for example. So this is a very simple gear system and I'll put some labels to it. Now, what is actually happening at the gear tooth interaction, right? We know that there are two forms of uh, motion. In you know, anywhere above and below the pitch line, we have both a sliding and a rolling contact. And you can see that in the interaction of the surfaces. Whereas at the pitch line, the pitch line is kind of defined by the fact that we only have rolling motion. But again, it's a combination of different contact points. We either have rolling or we have rolling and sliding. Furthermore, when you actually look at the contact surfaces between the gears in sort of like a 3D scenario, again, it's a line contact rather than being a point contact. So this is where the four ball test is kind of unique, right? If you think about three different spheres that are arranged in a triangle and look at it from above, what you'll notice is that there are three infinitesimally small point contacts. Now, of course, I say infinitesimally small, that would be if they were perfect spheres and nothing is a perfect sphere. So there is a little bit of surface area to it. But nevertheless, we are simulating an absolute point contact. Now, what we do in the four ball test is we introduce a fourth ball, which sits above these. And of course, now I have another three points of contact. There's obviously one behind here that we can't see. And now what we're going to do is we are going to rotate that top ball and keep the other three stationary. So in that very severe circumstance that I was talking about at the very beginning of this video, we have something that is rolling. The other three infinitesimally small contacts are held stationary. And so what we have is a point load that is in a sliding motion. So this is kind of like the worst of all worlds. Not only that, we're, we're gonna apply a force. And this is why we talk about it as an EP test, right? It's testing the extreme pressure performance of the lubricant and the lubricant's capacity to resist both wear and welding. So remember, if we if we had no lubricant and we put a force on that top ball and we just span it as fast as possible, then what we would get is a welding between all the balls. Now, 
what are the sort of the parameters for the test? Because we do have some ASTM standards around this. So the four ball wear and the four ball weld test are kind of two separate tests that use the same apparatus. So there's different ASTM numbers for both greases and oil. It's generally fixed load, speed, temperature and time and the amount of load that's applied is controlled. Now the 15 kilograms of force I think is only for the oil test and not for the grease test. Someone might have to check uh, just in case I'm wrong about that one. And it's defined at a certain speed, temperature, and duration. And at the end of the test, we measure the size of the wear scar. So it will often be defined as wear scar diameter in millimeters. Now, you can actually vary any of these numbers, right? We could take the speed up to 1600 RPM. We could vary the temperature. But using the same apparatus, but these just would not conform to the ASTM's test methods. So that's the four ball wear test. Then you have the four ball weld test. And, you know, we're using the same apparatus, but we're using a slightly different speed and temperature. And this time we're not going to define the duration because we are increasing the load until we see welding between the balls. Now welding, okay, is kind of defined in a few different ways uh, according to the test. So maybe we see like a sharp movement. Uh, maybe we see a whole bunch of noise at the motor. Maybe we see smoking from the ball pot. There's different ways that we can determine that the balls have started to weld. And the load at which that occurs is defined as the four ball weld load. Okay, so this gives us a couple of different parameters. Now, where does this test fall down? This gets to the question about why do we create bench tests in our world? When we're doing bench testing, we are trying to simulate conditions which might occur in the real world, but we're trying to do so in a way that is extremely repeatable and hopefully relatively cheap. So you can see from the four ball test that it's relatively cheap to set up. All you need is um, some balls that have very precise machining around them, but it's very easy to replicate the test. And because of this, it's become kind of a go-to within the industry in terms of formulating and screening formulations. It does give you a measure of the EP performance of an oil or a grease. The challenge is that it's replicating a condition that doesn't really occur in the real world anywhere. Right? So as we've demonstrated, when you look at bearings and when you look at gears and when you look at other lubricated systems, there is never really a situation in we have point loads where it's a completely sliding contact. And so this is where we run into a few issues. Um, really, this test was designed as a screening tool for formulators, but I worry a little bit that we've now taken it into the realm of lubricant selection. And especially if you look at uh, OEM, uh, especially if you look at OEM specifications, you'll often see the four ball performance listed as part of the OEM specs. And here's why I really think that that should not be the case. As it happens, there was a study done by the FZG Institute in 2008, which evaluated different test rigs for their kind of correlation to real world performance. What they're trying to demonstrate is which one actually correlates to real world performance. And what they did here is something really interesting. They took a variety of gear oils and a hydraulic oil and they tested them against milk and beer. So household items, which we know for a fact, do not lubricate all that well in the real world. And what they found was a little bit alarming in terms of the, the relation of four ball testing to the real world. So we've got an SAE 90 gear oil, which performed pretty well on the FZG test. So I'm going to highlight the FZG performance here. A CLP 220 gear oil also performed quite well. So now we're talking about a fail stage 12 in the FZG test. The hydraulic oil, which contained anti-wear additives and some EP additives, again, performed quite well, even though it's only an ISO 46. The CLP220, which contained both lead and sulfur, didn't perform quite as well, but it still has some EP performance to it. A straight C220 base oil obviously didn't perform as well as the additized versions because obviously heavily loaded situations is where we start to rely on the additive package. And of course, milk and beer did not perform as well as their fully formulated counterparts. But this is where things get a little bit weird because when you look at the four ball performance of these products, right? The SAE 90 gear oil did pretty well. The CLP 220 did not do all that well. And the hydraulic oil also not so good. The CLP 
20 that contained the lead did very well. The base oil, not so well. And then the milk and the beer kind of had mid-level performance. And the thing which is kind of stark about this is when you, when you look at the, the performance range, what you can see is that milk and beer in the four ball test are performing as well, if not better, than the fully formulated lubricants. Whereas for the FZG test, the, the spread is much more as you would expect from real world performance. The kicker here is that if you actually look across and read across the performance of milk, milk performed better than the HLP46 hydraulic oil as well as the 220 base oil. It performed as well as the CLP220. And we know that this doesn't correlate to real world performance. So the question is, why does the FZG rig match real world performance where the four ball test doesn't? Well, the, the FZG test rig replicates real world conditions much better than the four ball test does, right? Four ball testing, again, infinitesimally small points only operating in a sliding condition, whereas the FZG test rig is actually two gears that are actually meshing together and we're getting kind of like real world scuffing performance. So what exactly does this mean for you? Well, it doesn't mean that I'm, I'm definitely not advocating that we should take the four ball test and just completely throw it out. It's a hugely useful tool, especially for formulators who can use it to rapidly screen some of their formulations for EP performance. What I am saying is it's not the be all and end all and it's not representative of real world performance. So when you're doing selection of an EP lubricant or an EP grease, maybe don't rely on the four ball test. And maybe we should be trying to advocate for some OEMs to maybe remove it from their screening criteria for OEM approvals.